Cody Simmer was a managing, is a managing director at Techstars, and he's focused on products that change the world. Since 2012, he's been the chief product officer at StumbleUpon. Before StumbleUpon, he was with Yahoo for seven years, and he was the VP of Global Product Management for Yahoo's Entertainment and Lifestyles product portfolio. His, his portfolios included Yahoo Movies, Yahoo Music, Yahoo TV, OMG, Shine, and Yahoo Games. He's also a lecturer at USC's Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism. Please give a warm welcome to our host of the next panel, Cody Zimmer. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, I'm Cody, I'm really happy to be here today with, uh, with Vader and we have a, a really exciting panel here. Uh, I guess I'll welcome everyone to the stage. We've got uh, Adam Lilling from Plus Capital. We've got uh, Molly Matheson from WME and Robin Ward from UTA. Uh, thank you guys very much. Thank you, Cody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're here to talk about an exciting topic for being in LA. We're here to talk about how the entertainment world and the technology worlds are coming together, and in particular, how the entertainment industry is starting to invest in technology and in the startups. Um, so real quickly, if you guys want to each give your background, and then we'll dive into a few questions. OK, I'll start. Um, I uh, actually just had my one year anniversary with United Talent Agency last week. Um, I was hired to head up New Media Ventures there after having spent 15 years on the startup side of the equation, working in operations, business development, fundraising. The idea was to bring that skill set over to the agency for our work with early stage companies. And uh, the New Media Venture Group includes now investing, which is a newer endeavor for UTA. So. We've been investing for about eight months and just uh, invested in our sixth deal. Awesome. I'm Molly Matheson at WME. Um, I currently manage our early stage investments. I've been at the agency for six years, started in the mailroom on the music side, uh, worked my way over into the digital group, and then now um, overseeing all of our investments in our portfolio, which is about 30 companies. Um, we consider ourselves strategic investors. We don't have a fund structure. We have about, um, I would say, six to maybe 10 deals that we're doing this year, so we're pretty active and writing checks in the range of $100,000 to $500,000, um, mostly in consumer tech and media-based businesses. Hi, I'm Matt. Hi, I'm Adam Lilling. Uh, I was a startup entrepreneur since the early 90s. Uh, I'm co-founder of Launchpad LA, and about uh, two years ago, I started Plus Capital, which is uh, plus in the larger sense is like a family office for influencers, celebrities, athletes, musicians, their business managers, entertainment attorneys. We invest through Plus Capital LP in Series A startups, uh, mostly consumer internet. Um, we also incubate and work on business development deals with some of our talents as well, but it's all partners. They're all LPs in our fund. Awesome, thank you guys. And uh, you know, the first question that came to mind for me when I was thinking about this topic was really thinking about, okay, entertainment industry and investing, what are entertainment industry folks investing in? And, you know, what I tended to observe is you would think the entertainment industry was going to be all about investing in entertainment stuff. And you certainly see that, but you also see a lot of people investing in SaaS and B2B and enterprise solutions. And I just wondered, you know, from your perspectives, if what percentage of folks from the entertainment industry do you see trying to invest in things that they feel they can strategically help influence? either through their influence, through their celebrity, through their brand, through their presence, versus purely viewing it as a financial vehicle and looking to invest in just hot tech companies in general? Um, I think that there's a mix of strategies out there depending on who it is. I can speak for UTA. Um, ours is uh, not a traditional fund structure either in that you know it's, it's partner money off of the balance sheet and we have a very specific mandate and that is to invest in things that we think are strategic, which means um, 
you know, we are going to roll our sleeves up. I'm going to be helpful on the operations side and the fundraising side. We've got an 11 person digital media team that can be helpful in all kinds of ways to an early stage company. We have a brand studio. Obviously, we have the traditional side of the business to help. So our mandate really is to get involved in things that we know our clients, whether it's an entertainment property, talent, or brands, um, there's a need in the marketplace and or we've just seen an inefficiency. So that could be something that's a SaaS model. That could be an enterprise product, whether it's a data and analytics product for um, helping the studios market better, which we all know they could use that tool. But the entire idea for where we put our money is that it is directly related to media and entertainment tech. Yeah, we're, we're pretty similar in that aspect. I mean, we're looking for businesses that, you know, one, we can understand, and then two, we can really be helpful with. And, you know, that might be a big consumer brand. Um, it might be, you know, a B2B product that ha helps our clients, you know, monetize content, distribute content. Um, so those are two kind of core areas. I think there is a small subset of investors in Hollywood who have spent a lot of time up north and who have really kind of you know, educated themselves in other sides of technology and are investing in other sides of technology, and that's great. Um, it just, you know, it's not sort of what the at least our agency is focused on. Uh, I, I would actually just go back to the last uh, conversation that Jessica Alba was just in. I mean, if you look at, uh, if you look at it, you could break it into three categories. There are people like Jessica that are self-determined. They actually have a mission and they want to be involved in something that is far less than 1% of the people in Hollywood. I mean, far less than 1%. That, that would actually take and have an opportunity cost of their time and actually focus on something that they have a passion for. There's a second category of people that are just really into some vertical or interest. Sometimes it's enterprise, sometimes it's, it's consumer. It's a lot easier to get people into consumer, but one of the guys in my fund, uh, Omar Epps, who was on House and was, uh, has a show Resurrection on ABC, he loves tech so much that he spends a lot of time with our security company, Previty, or with NFC technology. So it's really kind of, if your interest is technology, then you'll gravitate even toward enterprise or, or hardcore tech. But I'd say probably 90% of people are just either trying to find their way in getting involved because they know they should, or just have a passion area or an interest and they're just focusing on that. Yeah, that that's really the three buckets for us. Cool. Um, and I'm curious, we talked a little bit about, uh, Molly, you talked about investors who are going up north and kind of educating themselves. Curious about the opposite. So, you know, you guys, I'm sure all of you talk to a lot of Bay Area folks who are coming down here, whether it's entrepreneurs coming to LA, trying to um, plug into the LA entertainment world, or whether it's Bay Area investors coming down to LA, frankly, often to try to do the same. Um, what are some of the most frequent questions you get from folks when they come down, from the Bay Area in particular, kind of getting to know LA more? Um, well, I just like to say that, that you know, for years LA faced this, uh, you know, a lot of the investors up north would say, oh, you gotta move up to San Fran, or you should move up to San Fran. And there's a lot of great folks like Aaron Levy at Box that didn't stay in LA in, in the, you know, earlier days when he was getting going. And I think what's really interesting now is I've actually been meeting with a lot of San Francisco area companies that are media and entertainment, and they're moving down here. Mm -hmm. They're like, we know we need to move to LA. And so I just love that sort of swap. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's interesting things that they like to, you know, learn about is really just the culture of the ecosystem because it's a lot different than San Francisco. Um, so, and I think even when you're pitching investors, there's a big difference in an investor pitch um, and what's expected in San Francisco versus the way that they, they run in LA. So <laughs> I'd say advice, advice along those lines. It's a lot more casual and informal down here. Yeah. yeah, I think that, you know, with entrepreneurs, unfortunately, the number one question is like, how can I get a celebrity or influencer to use my product? And that's sometimes like, well, most of the time, it's just not an interesting conversation to have with, with where they are at. Um, and then with, with, uh, with investors, I think, you know, right now, there's a lot of early stage seed investors who are coming to LA, and they think, you know, for the later stage Series A investors, they're wondering, who are the LA seed investors that I should be talking yeah. to? Where is that community? Where's my deal flow from here? Because, you know, that's how they're gonna get in touch with a lot of these businesses. Um, and there isn't the community that you see in New York yet, or, or um, you know, obviously up north. And on that note, just before Adam talks to, for any of you looking to understand the, you know, who's investing in LA, Go to uh, Greg Bettinelli, who's a partner at Upfront Ventures, go to his website, and he has published a Google Doc on his website 
Um, he has a link in the left column called Long LA, and it's literally a giant spreadsheet of LA investors. It's amazing. Yeah, it's an amazing list. Um, you, they answered it really well, so I'll just add one thing, which is on the VC side, which, you know, since I kind of play this role in between the startups and the, and the celebrities as well, um, very few venture capitalists actually want celebrities involved in the startup. So as much as a lot of entrepreneurs in LA are running around LA with celebrities attached or advisors or anything like that, I find that it has a negative effect for most uh, true, ven you know, top tier, top quartile venture capitalists. Um, and the only other ones that come down here asking about Hollywood just, you know, ask me if I've met Ellen or something. Like they're just more about interesting about Hollywood because they don't understand it. But the investors that actually are in it to make money are uh, want to know where they're providing value and and how why you're using them before there's any product market fit or any traction for scale and, and those kind of things. So I'd be very careful with telling Silicon Valley that you have celebrities attached. We've seen some really high profiles even this week, right? It was what Snoop Dogg and Jared Leto going into Reddit, right? So it it certainly seems like it's happening more and more. Yeah, it's happening a lot more and more. And you'll find it in later stage, uh, and it's working well in series C, D, E, mm. maybe sometimes in B, but not C to A, not at all. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's very rarely have we found one that it works. Mm. And, and I built a thesis around it, and whoops. You know, I mean, I started at seed, I've now moved to A, and as I look forward, I'll probably focus more on it in B and C and do it a larger size, because series C to A is very difficult. Yeah. Celebrity. I would say, um, in addition to that, to underscore what Molly said, is there's the getting of getting celebrities involved in, in the, the financing process, and then there's this um, still popular notion that linking up with a celebrity is going to ensure that you're going to have a billion dollar business. And I would say that, you know, coming off of the Brian Lee and, and Jessica Alba and Honest Company, I mean, that's one of maybe a handful of examples where you actually really see something like that work. And it is really interesting the number of times a day, particularly when I was early on at UTA and people would come in and basically their marketing plan was they thought that I was going to pimp their business to one of our celebrities who actually can make millions and millions on film and TV and doesn't care about your app. Um, and so, you know, that's just a really interesting thing that hopefully in the next like 18 months will go away, which is uh, early stage folks, particularly the LA based folks thinking that you're just going to link up with celebrity and that's your number one marketing plan. Hopefully that will die out. Well, and I think Brian Lee in particular, uh, if I'm not mistaken, like he's a real exception there in that he's now so, built three businesses yes. working together with celebrities. So that's like an area he actually knows how to do, yeah. right? With Shoot Azzle on his company and even LegalZoom, mm -hmm. right? So, But uh, rare. But rare, right? Um, so another question I have is, you know, we talk a lot about media getting into the tech world. I'm curious where you guys are seeing tech practices move into the media world. Things like lean startup, experimentation, A-B testing, and the first thing that comes to my mind is I see the YouTube ecosystem probably creating a lot of that. You know, curious where you see examples of that happening in general and how early stage startups can take advantage of that potential top of, if it's top of mind in people's mind, I don't know if it is. I think um, in the publishing space in particular, you'll see all of that. There were lots of deep conversations about BuzzFeed and BuzzFeed taking in the money that they took in from the folks they took it in and the whole conversation about how that's sort of a, a full stack approach. And Mashable also has built a whole technology, I can't remember the name right now, but it's basically on how they know if something's gonna trend. And mm -hmm. so all of those companies are, are investing heavy dollars that are coming from San Francisco into what is a media company so that they can be data driven. So I think that you see that sort of data component starting to uh, make its way into to all of the Hollywood businesses, although some much slower than others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know we've seen on the on the content side, you know, this model of, of sort of lean production happening for a while. You know, I think it was Funny or Die in like '07 was the first one to really come out and have, you know, people who celebrities who were you know equity owners of their company, who were co-founders of the company. Sequoia was backing it. You know, they were pumping out like 50 videos a month, I think, you know, which is just like unheard of back then, and sort of like setting the stage for a lot of the MCNs to sort of like take that forward. Um, today, I think it's really hard for the studios, especially, to really think about how do we shift our entire model. So, and maybe they shouldn't, but do, by doing things like 
bringing in an accelerator program. That's like a perfect example of a way you can sort of, you know, start to understand like how to be innovative, how to work with startups, but not you know screw up the model and, and keep that kind of yeah. in itself. Yeah. Actually, I'll defer to you because you actually have exactly the moment right now where like I can't say that other than Netflix and you know businesses like Netflix that are kind of adapting people's practices to financing and other other things within the media business or workflow. You have, you know, kind of a real-world ground zero for it. Do you see anything? Cody you know, Sims. With, uh, what Cody do you think? Sims? Cody Sims. Do you have anything? Uh, <laughs> do you have anything? With you know, the Disney I, I mean, Disney is uh, embrace of, of their, their. I mean, it's their own accelerator, but the il amount of involvement that they've had with us and with tech stars and with the startups has been phenomenal. Um, has it changed any of their practices? I, you know, it's, I think it's too early to say, but you know, the amount that, that that I think there's, you always say that good mentorship happens when there are. Um, when both sides of the mentor relationship are, are learning from each other. So I hope that together we've all been able to accomplish that in the accelerator, absolutely. Um, thank you, sir. So, uh, you know, one thing I'm curious about is last decade we saw tech totally disrupt the music industry, totally disrupt the publishing industry. Um, to where I actually think that caused a lot of ant antagonism. And I feel like with TV and film, it seems like there has been a lot of transition. If you look at Apple TV, you look at iPads, you look at um, Netflix, but it seems like that transition has been more harmonious. This is a, just a kind of a you know, theoretical question for you guys. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you think we're about to like, run into a buzzsaw? What, like, what do you see happening? I partially disagree, and okay. the only reason I would is, if you look back 10 years, the music business was a smaller business, and also, I mean, from a total market opportunity, and also there just wasn't, digital wasn't making a lot of money for the studios, or wasn't making a lot of money where it could disrupt. You look at companies like Netflix, um, Hulu, or Amazon, or any of these companies that are starting to kind of change the way Hollywood works in some way, and it's great for Hollywood, but if you look at the incumbents, you know, they're all sitting here saying, I think we just sold part of our future away for taking these big checks up front. And you couldn't have done that 10 years ago because there wasn't enough of a market to kind of throw down that kind of money like Netflix and others have done. So I think it's still yet to be determined if it's harmonious. I think it's actually just we can now play at, this, at, at big levels. So you've got Vice growing and now you might make a cable. Like now all of a sudden you've got to pay attention. So I don't know what's going to happen with incumbents yeah. and digital other than having to buy it mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah, I think that's very true. And then, you know, even looking at television, which is still a massive business, like I think TV advertising dollars have only continued to go up, which just shows like, you know, the, the best place to reach a mass audience is still on television. Um, there is still, you know, a growing, huge shift happening with millennials and, you know, teenagers growing up on the internet. They're only watching videos on their mobile phone. I think that's only going to increase. Um, but it still hasn't happened yet. The fi next five years, I think, are going to be really interesting for that. I think that, that I would agree with what these guys are saying and that I think it's an equally steep decline that's just happening maybe over a longer period of time. So some people will be able to adjust and sort of come out on top of that and some people will still just kind of hide and not make the decisions they need to make. Um, but I don't know if it's better to have uh, sort of, let's say, the internet or technology hurt your business quickly or have it be sort of a, a long drawn out scenario where you can sort of keep one eye closed and then maybe you wake up one day and it sort of hit you. It seems like there's this delayed reaction sometimes in some of these, you know, whether it's television, the networks, the studios, obviously the music industry had a delayed reaction that hurt them. So I think that it just depends on the company to how quickly yeah. they adjust to what's going on. I'm being told we are out of time. Um, Already, Cody Sims? We are out of time. So thank you all very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank